post-injury care in the modern workplace. I'm Stephanie from WorkSafe Tasmania, your moderator. In recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, we acknowledge Tasmanian Aboriginal people, the original and continuing custodians of the land, sea and sky. We acknowledge and pay our respects to all Tasmanian Aboriginal people, all of whom have survived invasion and dispossession and continue to maintain their identity, culture and Aboriginal rights. Can you please now take a moment to read the following slide about information received today? Please use the chat panel on your screen to type and submit questions uh, for today's presenter. Those questions will be answered at the end of today's webinar. Only presenter webcams uh, will be used during today's presentation and today's presentation is also being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your presenter today, Dr. Mary Wyatt from It Pays to Care, Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Mary is an occupational physician dedicated to translating research into practice. With decades of experience in injury management, Mary has implemented early intervention case management for several medium to large employers. Mary was a general practitioner before specialising in occupational medicine in the 1990s. Her career includes conducting independent medical examinations, managing the not-for-profit returntoworkmatters.org, researching return to work for Safe Work Australia, teaching at Monash University, and reviewing return to work and claims management schemes for policymakers. Mary leads the Australasian Faculty of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, Royal Australasian College of Physicians, latest policy initiative, It Pays to Care, which advocates for evidence-based practices in work injury schemes to benefit both workers and workplaces. And we welcome Mary today. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I have some notes here and I'm going to turn my video off. It just makes it a bit more pragmatic in terms of referring to to those notes and still looking like I'm here for you guys. Um, so the, the talk today is about the breadth of psychosocial issues that impact workers. We're going to talk a bit about the impact of organisational culture on prevention and recovery after injury. We're going to talk a bit about the differences and the overlaps in the systems and thinking in terms of return to work and OHS, and then perhaps how to bring the two together. Now, if you're in a small to medium business, you may not have a team to bring together, but it might be just your thinking, but there is still applicability in bringing those, that thinking together. And whether you're an organisation with just one in OHS and return to work, or larger with a team, uh, this is applicable. So we'll talk about perhaps bringing the thought processes together um, and then developing that integrated approach. Sorry about that. Um, there's the, let's move on. So uh, the first section, the connection between workplace culture and psychosocial hazards and um, return to work. So you'll all be familiar, I'm sure, with psychosocial hazards in the workplace, so those things that impact our well-being, uh, like job control, workload, relationships at work, uh, the, the nature of the work, the level of support at the workplace, role clarity, all of these things uh, important psychosocial hazards that impact workplace culture. So understanding the connection, the, the, if, we, if we understand the connection and develop and enrich that connection, it makes both sides of the fence, the prevention and recovery side more effective. First up, there's shared factors and one influences the other. So if you've got a poor workplace culture, there's pre-existing stress, and that makes coping with an injury harder, 
and also less likely to be successful. Um, if you're stressed, your recovery will likely be slower. Then there's the workplace culture and, and the systemic issues at play. So a poor safety culture tends to translate into a poor return to work culture. And those unaddressed psychosocial hazards become barriers to return to work. And then lastly, uh, if we understand each other, if we understand both sides of that prevention and recovery fence, then we're better in a better position to kind of help a continuous feedback loop and also contributions from both for all of those involved. So if there's one, there's a measure of organisational culture or psychosocial hazards. It's not exactly psychosocial hazards, the psychosocial safety climate. And there are many tools to assess psychosocial culture at work. So the People at Work survey, which is out from um, Safe Work Australia, has also been around for a long time and a valuable tool. There are many valuable tools to measure the organisational climate. There's, the PSC has been widely studied internationally and it's probably been the most studied tool. So that's why I'm talking about that today. So the uh, psychosocial safety climate is a questionnaire which measures policies and practices that protect a worker's psychological health. And it looks at management commitment, management priority, organisational communication and participation. And it's just a tad broader in terms of bringing in management uh, than, say, the People at Work survey. And it's a 12-question 12, 12 survey, um, final score out of 60. And the higher the score, the better the culture. Now, why is it important? Because it's a lead indicator of workplace psychological health. If you know what the PSE is, you're pretty good positioned to be able to predict work stress and psychological health. <clears throat> um, and it's used in a variety of settings, so risk assessments, benchmarking, intervention planning and program evaluation. Uh, so uh, the chart on the left here shows you return to work after a work injury, depending on the organisational culture. And you can see with a high PSC, the average of 48 from this particular study, um, had a significant reduction in work injury claim numbers, but also significant reduction in the time to return to work. Uh, and also sickness absence. It's not just workers' comp, but for every point increase, uh, there's better sickness absence as well. Uh, so the, there are many other correlations, significantly lower chance of developing anxiety or depression, work engagement is higher, workplace bullying is significantly less, and productivity is improved. So many other correlations. And I was looking at a paper last night looking at healthcare, and in fact, healthcare outcomes are better in hospitals where they have better culture and that's been known for some years. <clears throat> We've had that data from the UK where better culture is associated with better outcomes for patients according to the trust or the region. So good organisational culture or um, you know, low levels of psychosocial hazards helps prevent physical numbers of claims and helps prevent psychological claims. It makes return to work easier and it also helps HR. So it helps um, HR in fact there's lower turnover of staff, there's better productivity, less sickness absence, and just generally uh, things flow better in an organisation with good culture. So let's talk more specifically now about return to work. So we know that preventing psychosocial hazards makes a big difference to um, injury occurrence and injury return to work. But what are more specifically the factors that influence these issues? So when a worker's coming back to work after a work injury, there are many issues that they have to deal with. So if, if they have lowish confidence, there might be fear and anxiety. Uh, there's, they may be coming back to a workplace where there's not a great deal of support. There may be stigma about return to work after an injury. 
And that may be subtle. So the, the people saying these kind of off-the-cuff, semi-humorous remarks don't really have a sense of the impact on the person. There might be duties they're given that aren't really clear, and this is quite a common issue. So people are sort of, you do this and you do that, but if there's not enough work, then it can make it difficult to find what they're doing. Um, the the organisation might have changed while they're away from work, and they often have a loss of work identity because they can't be their normal self, their normal contributor, strong person at work, a uh, clever person at work, a uh, productive person at work, or even just somebody who fits in and is normal and is not entirely visible. You become very visible once you've had a work injury. So it's not just the normal hazards at work, the normal psychosocial hazards at work, such as work overload or lack of support, but these things are then compounded by the hazards the individual faces. So they're often frustrated with the process. There's delays, there might be things that are held up, um, delays in treatment. So it's a lot, for a lot of people, it can be a frustrating time. And then it's extra hard to manage things at home if they're in pain or anxious, et cetera. And we're all human. Our thoughts and beliefs play a big role in our lives. We all, we are all like this. You know, we're not logical. I'm not logical. You know, if, um, if we have something, we're having a bad time, then we might overreact to something. Or if we had a bad experience in the past, we might have beliefs. I thought when I had my first pregnancy, I would have a miscarriage because my sister did. And I'm a doctor and I've delivered lots of babies. So, you know, again, it's not logical, but this is the way we are as human beings. And so the barriers there are in our normal lives compounded by having a work injury and also the influence of others. People will share their experience. Sometimes what happens to your next door neighbour is more important than what the doctor tells you. So, um, all these things influence. We're not just our sore back or our painful shoulder or our anxious disposition. We are our whole lives. And so in the world of return to work, I think of it as the world of overcoming barriers. There are so many barriers everywhere if we look at return to work. In healthcare, we introduce all sorts of barriers. We do lots of tests. We tell people that they have disc degeneration and they think their spine is crumbling and we tell them they have a tear in their shoulder and, and that doesn't sound like it'll get better by itself. And all of these things are not medically logical, but that's what we as doctors do. We have a tendency to over-treat and over-diagnose. And, you know, life these days is we have this sort of algorithm of base of life of it should be simple and easy, you know. I This person cut out these four things in their diet and lost 60 pounds or 14 kilograms or whatever. Life sounds to be easy and we have a strong focus on fixing things in medicine rather than educating the person about how to manage the condition themselves and we roll them with kind of agency when we do that. Um, as I mentioned before, personal factors are compounded by the barriers and the difficulties in having a claim, uh, perceived injustice is a big one, and then um, poor communication or legalistic discussion can then compound things further. So just to talk a bit about the impact of psychosocial factors, if we look at long-term claims, studies and they're variable in how they look at this and therefore the results but studies say that up to 85 percent of the reason people stay off work long term is because of psychosocial barriers now this actually applies whether somebody's had a spinal cord injury or whether they've had a relatively straightforward simple back strain um, the physical problems are more of an issue in the first few months. And after that, uh, we do see a much greater impact of psychosocial barriers. And of course, the longer time goes on, the easier it is to identify those barriers, but the harder it becomes to shift them because everything becomes entrenched. So relationships break down or people become solid in their beliefs, they've got a terrible condition. Uh, and substantially disabled. So 
But, and data from New South Wales shows we can actually predict these situations and predict these barriers within a week of the injury. So good data from New South Wales looked at people who had, uh, they did 200 people, they assessed their psychosocial risks through the short form of Rebro, which is a pain musculoskeletal questionnaire that asks about beliefs and um, really is looking for distress. And the higher the score, the more likely it is the person will stay off work. So the average, it kind of assessed that if you're over 50, you're at elevated risk. And those over 50, according to this study, had three times the amount of time off work, which is what you can see in the chart here on the right. And another way of expressing that was for every one point increase in the Arebro score, the chance of work went down by 4%. So pretty powerful predictor of those at elevated risk and those who can benefit from extra psychosocial support. And more importantly, psychosocial factors in return to work, identify them early and you can make a major difference. Now, this has been implemented at um, public hospitals in New South Wales, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about this study. It's an important study. It was recognized internationally around the world as a best paper in Journal of Occupational Rehabilitation in 2020. Um, and in medicine, we love seeing great outcomes from an intervention study. But what we'd like even more is to see that study replicated. So if it's repeated, do we get similar results? Or is it kind of really, it was just something to do with the circumstances of the original study? And the study was replicated at Australia Post. And towards the end of the presentation, there's some links which will take you to videos which actually talk in more depth about both programs if you have an interest. These were systems implemented in large employers and other large employers are doing this, learning from each other, um, from those who've implemented. So the system was fairly, I say, fairly simple and modular. So within the week of the claim being lodged, there was a phone interview with the worker and completion of the short form of Rebra by phone. So they just read out the questions and work and then scored them. And those at elevated risk were referred for three things. So the first was extra psychological support. So it was suggested that actually, why don't we address those psychosocial barriers straight away and try and prevent them becoming set in concrete. And so um, and only 50% of people took this up, and these are the results you're looking at. So about 50% took it up, and they had up to six sessions with a psychologist, very practical, here and now, coaching, counselling, and the average number of sessions was five. There was extra workplace support provided by the return to work coordinator, understanding if there were particular workplace issues and then trying to address them. And then there was extra healthcare support. So the extra healthcare support in this system was an injury management consultation, which is a specific exam in New South Wales where the specialist is seeing the person and they will communicate with the GP. And the intent behind that was to make sure the GP was on evidence-based treatment, but also they were comfortable with the return to work capacity. Uh, and what you can see here is the costs by month. So this was set up at a whole bunch of public hospitals in New South Wales, and the rest of the hospitals were control hospitals where they just had usual care. And so what you're seeing here is the claims cost. So in the blue, here are the controlled hospitals where they had usual care, and you can see that, you know, ongoing claims cost beyond 30 months, and beyond seven months, the claims costs are more expensive and ongoing, obviously. So 
In the intervention hospitals, you can see a slightly higher increase in costs in the first few months, and that's not surprising considering there was excellent psychology and the injury management consultation. Um, but, you know, much reduction in longer term claims costs, and look at that, that almost represents no ongoing long term disability. And of course, there will be people who've got ongoing issues. But I think in general, we can say, you know, costs are a, 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 an approximate proxy for suffering and problems. And so um, we can't be absolute, but it does look like there's some significantly less long term problems uh, here. And certainly we can see a major reduction in long term disability. So very powerful evidence that it is important to identify psychosocial barriers early and, more importantly, address them. Now, it doesn't have to be this exact approach to modifying and addressing psychosocial barriers. Uh, so the Australia Post initiative, they are not going to have local psychologists around, but there were so called, they use local psychologists around the hospitals in New South Wales, but they're not necessarily going to have local hospitals or, or local psychologists around a, uh, an Australian post outlet in the Kimberleys in WA or uh, in remote Tasmania. So they did uh, online, or sorry, they did telephone counselling with the EAP provider, trained again in psychosocial counselling. It's important people are trained in psychosocial counselling and that they identify the specific barriers for that individual person, not just assume everyone has the same barriers because people will have certain things that are impacting them or causing them distress. Um, and so uh, I'll just finish up on that slide. And again, there are videos if you would like to learn more about those systems. So now if we talk about perhaps the approach you might use to bring prevention of psychosocial hazards and post-injury psychosocial care together. So I'll start by talking about the, the overlaps. Then I'm going to talk about the differences in thinking and systems between prevention and recovery because they are different beasts and we think differently. Oh, HNS people and recovery people think differently and it's not always a simple process to put them in the same room and, and get the sort of integrated approach. It does require thinking about it and, and working out the best ways. And once again, if you're in a small to medium business, you know, make this relevant and applicable for you, which might be a cut down version of this. So what are the overlaps? Well, first up, senior management engagement is important for both. Uh, senior management engagement shapes the tone for the organisation, it shapes the culture of the organisation, and in turn that shapes the recovery for injury and prevention, for prevention and for recovery. Uh, it drives resource allocation. So worker engagement is really important for both. Prevention, you get a lot of valuable insights to identify risks and, and workers are good at identifying solutions. Talk more about this on the next slide. Worker engagement fosters ownership and the prevention and recovery. Um, organisational cultures, obviously, the nub of both. And that also influences reporting and help seeking behaviour. So, you know, if you've got a good organisational culture where you're really active in encouraging early claim lodgement, much more likely you'll find out about these things early and deal with them early. Training and education, if, if you know that if you train and build awareness of psychosocial hazards in the workplace, you'll have more understanding of it and better mental health. And similarly, if you train people, and particularly line managers in how to manage work injuries, you'll get a lot better outcomes. And then continuous improvement, both within each field and between each field. If you can use prevention to um, influence return to work, and if you can use what's gone wrong in, you know, what is wrong in causing injuries in prevention, then that integrates it nicely. Both, both we want to focus on early intervention, so identifying hazards you want to get in early and deal with them, and ditto for psychosocial issues in return to work. 
um, holistic approach. You know, I've talked about the fact that we're people and, uh, you know, we want to do that. We want to connect that and, and realise that both in prevention and in work injury recovery. Communication is the oil that lubricates everything, both prevention and um, building trust for work injury management. When we've got trust, things just work smoothly or work way more smoothly. Risk assessment is important for both. We need to risk manage cases as well as risk manage hazards. And a, a, a framework for supportive policies makes a difference. So if you've got that framework where you're just naturally considering it all, then much more likely it will happen. Uh, and just going into a bit more detail about worker engagement, really this is so important. Um, when This is all of us. When we're engaged in something, when we've been involved in its development, when we understand it, we've been thinking about why, um, then we're much more likely to actually, um, you know, follow what's developed from it. We're much more likely to um, be part of the solutions, be able to identify solutions, be part of a cultural shift. We're much more likely to own it and support each other with it, as well as um, be involved with, you know, ongoing continuous improvement. So just thinking now about some of the barriers. So OHMS thinking typically is prevention oriented, obviously. Uh, it's systems based. So you think in a lot, you know, systems based thinking in a system of hierarchy of controls and across the workplace, it's proactive. There's a strong focus on compliance uh, as well as education. It looks at all of the workforce. Um, there's obviously a continuous improvement and regular risk assessments a key part of OHMS thinking. In return to work, it tends to be more individual centered and recovery focused, so reactive rather than proactive. Uh, it is outcome driven and adapt, adaptive. So if things change, then the system of return to work can change. So they come to the, the thinking is different naturally. And obstacles to actually sharing and overlapping for separate departments if you're a large enough organisation. But even if you're not, even if you're the one person juggling OHS and return to work, if you have a different professional background or if you uh, you know kind of tied up in the world of OHS and separately in the world of return to work that thinking can, can pervade how you approach your job as a juggler doing both. And of course, we all have competing priorities and sometimes it's just easier to stick to our own lane and we're just kind of spending all our time getting through our own lane and we don't have time to sort of expand what, we, what we're thinking about. The regulation is different, there's cultural differences. And um, if we don't have leadership support, it's hard to bring them both together. Uh, and if we don't have the resources, we, it's hard to bring them both together. So why bring them both together? Well, I think I've kind of alluded to this before. If we have it managed in a comprehensive way, prevention of psychosocial hazards, then we can help each other. We improve our identification of problems. We learn to mitigate them earlier. We have a stream, smoother transition between um, injury and recovery and we think more holistically and we're more likely to have a trust and so you know it's just likely to be all easier if we're working together. Uh, there are specific things that can help so if we have uh, data that's better if we have combined data sets of prevention and return to work and looking at the holistic data set we have a better proposition to go to management and talk about the whole uh, a whole framework, and we're better predicting problems, identifying risk departments, etc. Uh, we're more likely to be able to innovate if we're thinking more broadly and find innovations that work. And it's great for us to be sharing. Like I've focused here on 
uh, return to work and, and health and safety, bringing those departments together. But really, it's all applicable to HR as well. And if you can get the three groups together and you, if your organisation is big enough, it's even better uh, in terms of really being able to assess the whole picture and then to manage the whole picture. So then I've talked a bit about why you might want to bring them together and perhaps some of the barriers to bring them together. Let's talk a bit about how you might bring them together. So the, uh, these are a number of strategies which, which may or may not work for your organisation, but think about these as options. So shared risk assessments. Traditionally, oh and does risk assessments, but return to work people will often have a better understanding of the outcomes and impact. And if we're not sharing that data and you're having a nuanced approach to risk assessments, we might miss potential hazards. Collaborative planning, so setting up policies and procedures together or thinking about them both more broadly if you're um, one or the other or both together. Uh, Cross-training, so training together training your own team so if you've got if you're in an ohms group training the return to work coordinator or the reverse return to work coordinators training about the psychosocial hazards on return to work and unified reporting systems that helps ohms return to work hr and management and then joint case reviews um, we found a very effective way to broaden um, uh, oh and and return to work coordinate and line managers understanding was to actually review complex cases what had gone well and what hadn't gone well and sharing those insights at a practical level really helps drill down into specifics of what might be needing attention it allows thinking about well-being programs and what might be effective for that workplace and also that better continuous feedback loop. Integrated performance metrics, if you can get your KPIs right, I'm not a big fan of KPIs, but if you can get, if you, if you align your KPIs with what people feel is important and they bring in both parts of the equation, then they can be more useful and clearly get your senior leaders involved. And so if you want to kind of shift and bring them closer together, the great place to start is, either, is developing a plan and then bringing your shared leadership, you know, bringing your leaders on board and, and helping them understand why a shared leadership approach is, is important and what they can do more importantly to foster that. And then obviously, um, of fostering that more broadly in the workplace and helping the workplace understand more broadly the impact of psychosocial factors can make a meaningful difference. And really that the place to start with that is starting with senior managers to make sure they really get the importance of addressing these barriers, particularly reduction in claim numbers and reduced time to return to work. So depending on the size of your organisation, how might you go about it? Well, align strategy, if you're big enough to have a specific strategy, bring your teams together and, and perhaps even have a part of the role defining that it's going to be linked to oh &S. So you really set people up with role clarity about their involvement. Um, you, you know, bring together uh, return to work and doing risk assessment and have training for both and get that reported, uh, reported the unified reporting with both data included. Um, in engage leadership and involve employees. Can't stress enough how participatory input makes a difference uh, in engagement and outcomes. And then obviously fostering that continued improvement cycle. Now I can see I'm going to finish early today, Stephanie. Um, so I might turn on my camera and uh, talk through the last couple of slides. 
because I realised as I'm going, I'm really uh, talking mostly to the screen anyway. So turn the camera on. So the so key takeaways from today I wanted to impart you with are psychosocial factors are really important both in terms of prevention and when people come back to work. And that if you can think about integrating the two and bringing the two together, there are great payoffs in doing that. It does require a bit of energy and focus to make that happen, but there are significant benefits if you can bring your team on board with this. And the, I guess the last key point is that um, leadership and worker engagement are really key for both the prevention of psychosocial hazards and worker engagement. Um, I am going to spend a couple of minutes talking about It Pays to Care. Oops, I've put in a comma for the It Pays to Care dot. Uh, I can see straight away, so apologies for that. But here's the QR codes to scan us and see the It Pays to Care website and It Pays to Care on LinkedIn. It Pays to Care is policy from a College of Physicians, as Stephanie pointed out as well uh, and part of the College of Physicians is the Faculty of Occupational Environmental Medicine. Many of you may have heard of our, one of our earlier policies, the Health Benefits of Good Work, and that was a major policy in 2010. This policy looks at work injury scheme design. We know that the patients we serve, the working or would-be working population, have poorer outcomes in return to work after a compensable injury. It's a bit crazy because we spend all this extra money on helping people get back to work more quickly and providing extra treatment after a work injury. So the fact that outcomes are worse for the same condition, for the same severity, when it's a compensation case is really a bit mad. Uh, and we see the negative outcomes for our workers day in, day out. So we've worked over 20 years on policies in this area. The two I've mentioned are just some of those. We launched in April of 2022. We've been advocating with scheme leaders and then the claims industry over 2022 and 2023. And over 2024, we focused on engaging with the healthcare industry and employer land. And so we're broadening our approach. Um, the key principles are that if we get in early with work injuries, we can actually make a significant difference. I showed you some of the evidence in the policy with the WISE study in New South Wales of early psychosocial identification and care for those. But there's a plethora of evidence in the evidence-based paper, um, much of which really is just providing evidence for what we already know, that if you get in and look after people early, you can make a huge difference in terms of their outcomes, their well-being. But we've, we've kind of long-term had a mentality of kind of doing the same thing and the same thing. And uh, this endeavours to say, if you do the right things, you can save money. And the savings, potential cost savings are significant, but it doesn't mean getting in early and doing the right things in the right way. Um, so uh, I would encourage all of you to read the policy. It's about a three hour paper for the evidence-based paper and there's a values and principles-based paper which outlines the importance of values and principles in, in work injury schemes and um, sign up to our website or LinkedIn page or both uh, so we can give you updates ongoingly if you have an interest in this area. And on that note, Stephanie, I might stop and answer any questions there might be if there are any. Yes, no, and thank you, Dr. Mary Wyatt, uh, for your uh, webinar today for WorkSafe Tasmania Month. Um, so, Mary, where the injury is related to workplace behaviour, aggression or, or, or bullying, um, whether misconduct has been proven, how important uh, is a risk assessment for the person um, returned to work and the employees uh, in the work area they are returning to? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and it's absolutely vital. I mean, uh, we all know that sending the person back to the problem is unlikely to work and it would be vital for that person and for others to make sure that the issue had been addressed, um, both in terms of that person's recovery and also um, prevention of further problems like that. And any claim like that should flag an assessment, a risk assessment of what's going on and, um, uh, you know, prevention is vital in this case. Thanks, Mary. Um, can you point everyone uh, to uh, towards the PSC uh, questionnaire again? The slide for the PSC? Yes, if possible. Yes, or, certainly. Or, yes, the, it the, take, me, take me a few seconds to get back there. That's okay. And again, the webinar is uh, being recorded and will be made available at the end of WorkSafe uh, Tasmania Month on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. There are a few slides on PSC. I'm not sure if that's the one. While you're looking at that, Stephanie, the other thing I was reading about last night, oh, no, did I say that? I can't remember. Um, that in health organisations, the PSC also correlates, I did say that, with patient, with patient outcomes, yeah. Um, is there a, a link, Mary, uh, to the PSC uh, 12 questionnaire? Uh, I don't have that right now, but I can provide that. Stephanie, is there a mechanism to send that out? Uh, yes, if you uh, send it uh, through to WorkSafe Tasmania, then we can ensure that uh, attendees uh, receive that. I'll do, I'll do that, yep. Um, Mary, in, uh, in developing return to work support, how important is it to engage with workers and their managers that have lived experience to identify the successes and challenges of their experiences of post-injury engagement with the workplace and return to work process independent of the broader working group? Yeah, really great question. And again, it's vital. Um, perhaps what I might do, Stephanie, is also send you a link to a survey that can be done. Um, this is just a return to work survey. So it's very simple. It's like six questions. Uh, is your return to work going okay? Are you getting enough support? Blah, blah, blah. And it's a survey that you can do like in a week or a month and just ask people about their return to work experience. And it's really useful because you get learnings for that individual. Might be they have nothing but positive things to say, but it also might be showing you gaps. Uh, and, and if you do it regularly, you know, one week, one month, etc., you can see if things go off the rails a bit. So I'll see that and, you know, again, surveying your workers and understanding what's happening, key part of understanding. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, in respect to uh, risk assessment, are you um, talking uh, in respect to a, a general risk assessment um, or one for the individual? Um, I'm talking about both, really. You can do a risk assessment for an individual coming back to work, which would be a great thing to do if they've got a mental health claim. And it generally, you always want to, you know, inherently when we're doing suitable duties, we're assessing a risk in terms of physical capabilities, but, but also to assess the psychological capabilities, uh, you know, particularly in mental health claims, doing a risk assessment for that individual worker but also for your system. But also don't ever hesitate to do a risk assessment for somebody coming back with a physical problem because it um, does give you a lot of information about what you can deal with and what you can prevent. Thank you, Mary. Um, there's still time uh, for attendees to submit uh, questions for our presenter today, Dr. Mary White, who's presenting as part of uh, WorkSafe uh, Tasmania Month. Uh, Mary, do you have a suggestion for evidence-based risk assessments for return to work uh, for psych claims? Do I have a specific format for that? Uh, and if that's the question, no, I don't have a specific format to that. 
Um, but things I'd be checking off on a risk assessment when the person's coming back is the uh, role clarity, the actual duties, uh, and that they fit within the limitations, that there is supervisor support, that there is co-worker support. And so if there is any of those things missing, what you can do to address those. The support when the person comes back to work is the really key part of it. If you don't have, if you don't quite have role clarity, but you've got support, then the person will have that confidence to say, look, I don't think these journeys are really the, you know, they've got the right things or I'm having trouble getting through them or there's not enough to do. Um, but if you don't have that culture, then they'll just put up with it, put up with it, put up with it and give up. Um, yep. Yeah. So vital. Yep. All right. Thanks, Mary. Uh, is the traditional is the traditional hierarchy of control applicable to psychosocial risk assessment? Uh, to to uh, yes, I think so. Uh, it applies just as well. I mean, I could go we could go back to it and look at it if we like. Um, want me to do that, Stephanie? Yes, by all means. <laughs> well, there we go. So elimination is obviously, you, you know, eliminate some hazards where you can, psychosocial hazards where you can. Now, that may be difficult, but clearly that's the best way. I mean, if you've got a, uh, a toxic supervisor, then elimination of the problem will, you know, will, will be a big part of it. Uh, there might be substitution, so it might be seeing people face to face as a customer service person in Centrelink is a problem uh, because of the behaviours, but online is okay. So that for as an example, I'm not suggesting that what, what should happen, but that's an example of substitution. Uh, engineering controls, perhaps we can uh, make some of the tasks people have to do uh, uh, automated and that might reduce the workload so that's an example of engineering controls and then administrative controls or well, there's no real applicable PPE but administrative controls you know change the way people work um, also can contribute to um, return to work thinking so there's slightly different thinking, but it's also applicable. And I know that, um, and I haven't included it today, but I can include this again, Stephanie, which, uh, New Zealand, uh, WorkSafe New Zealand has a, uh, a, a graphic which shows the hierarchy of controls for return to work and uh, OHS in there. So perhaps if I send that through and that provides in graphic format um, the relevance of systems thinking to return to work. Thank you, Mary. Uh, there's still time uh, for those attendees uh, still with today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar to submit any questions for Dr. Dr. Mary Wyatt. Uh, WorkSafe Tasmania Month um, has kicked off uh, today. We have a two-week program of uh, webinars. Um, so please head to worksafe.tas.gov.au to see what other uh, webinars we have uh, running over the next uh, two weeks and then in Tasmania we also have a series of in-person um, events running from running in Devonport, uh, Launceston and Hobart as well. And Stephanie that reminds me to say uh, I am involved with two further webinars over the next couple of weeks and one is specifically on that system of identifying psychosocial barriers early and managing them so I'll be talking in more depth about that. I think it's next week. Stephanie, it must be if there's only two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Mary. Um, and just to uh, to wrap up today's uh, webinar, a few comments have come through. Uh, an excellent uh, webinar, so thank you, Mary. Informative and, and very comprehensive. Thanks, Stephanie, and thanks, audience. Thanks for participating. Thank you. And so thank you for everyone for attending today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar, Connecting the Dots, Psychosocial Hazards and Post-Care post-injury care in the modern workplace. Your presenter today has been Dr. Mary Wyatt from It Pays to Care 
Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Uh, as mentioned, WorkSafe Tasmania Month runs throughout the month of October. Please head to worksafe.tas.gov.au to see what other webinars and in-person events that we have running throughout the month of October. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. And then finally, uh, attendees will receive a feedback survey. Uh, we do appreciate you providing us uh, with uh, your feedback. It certainly helps us to improve um, WorkSafe Tasmania Month and other initiatives uh, that are funded by the Work Cover Tasmania Board. So thank you again, Mary, uh, for your webinar today and thank you everyone for attending.